So welcome everybody. What are we here to talk about tonight? Well, what you need to know about special needs planning. And we're very proud to give this talk in partnership with the Pacific Autism Center for Education, a wonderful organization. Um, I'm on the board of the Pacific Autism Center for Education. So I know many parents out there watching this likely have kids on the autism spectrum. Everything we're talking about here tonight is relevant for you. So why don't we jump in? Uh, over the past 35 years, actually really 40 years, our firm has worked with thousands of families with children with disabilities, and we hear something a lot, and you might relate to this. I'm afraid to die. And this is not a fear of the unknown of what happens to you after you pass away. It's a fear about what will happen to your kids if you pass away, especially if you have a child with a disability or on the autism spectrum or someone who in your family who needs your support? Who's gonna step in for you when you step out? What structures can we put into place to make sure your loved ones are cared for, that there's a financial safety net there for them? That's what this is all about. So Mike, why don't you go over the specifics of what we're gonna talk about here tonight? I, I, sure, and you know, just, just to reinforce what Mark said, you know, we understand thoroughly that this kind of planning is not just about a trust. You know, tr we'll go through some other elements tonight, but, you know, we understand we've been around this block so many times. We understand how complicated, how incredibly important it is to be really comprehensive and creative in our thinking. And I think you'll you'll see some of that this evening. So, OK, so the things we're going to cover tonight uh, very efficiently. This won't be too long. We're going to keep, we're going to keep it uh, crisp. OK, certainly talk about special needs planning with a focus on special needs trust, how they work, uh, what they're for, how they operate, et cetera. Making the point that beneficiaries are complicated. You know, everybody's unique. Uh, issues come up that you can't, you just can't see them in advance. And uh, the trustee, whoever manages it, ha has challenges. They have to understand the specific nature of the beneficiary of a particular trust of your kid. So the choice of the trustee we'll talk about. We're going to certainly talk about Proposition 19 and its impact on your ability to have your home retained for your child, or maybe if you have a second home that you envision being the home for your child with a disability. Prop 19 is a real problem, and we'll go through that a little bit later. We're certainly going to talk about the integration of planning. We've already alluded to it by saying you need to be comprehensive in your thinking. Uh, Mark's going to talk a little bit later about the benefits, uh, one might even say the need, to integrate the legal and estate planning that we do with the financial planning side of things. Everything needs to, in this situation, in this context of the evening, to be focused on special needs. And how does it all fit together? Um, we're going to end, of course, with discussion of what action steps you can take, you should take. Uh, very comprehensive. We have a lot to cover this evening. And this is clear, this is not legal advice. It's for educational purposes only. To give legal advice, we have to meet with you and know your specific situation. Um, and just really quickly, for those of you who don't know us, we're very proud of our history. We uh, we are pioneers in the area of special needs planning. As far as we know, we were the second firm in the state of California, that's thousands of law firms, to do special needs trust, or what is now known as special needs trust. So my parents, Michael Gelfix and Myra Gerson Gelfix, along with Francis LePole, really were pioneers. We've written articles and books about this. We've served thousands of families, and our goal is to give you peace of mind. We're very proud that we've been featured all over the national media. And, and again, we want to educate and empower you so you can take those steps to protect yourself and your family. And as we jump in, I want to start with a mystery. Um, two families, same situation starting out. Tom and Sarah versus Mike and Eve. Both of them have a child on the special needs Spectrum on the autism spectrum, Jane and Kate, their two daughters. Tom and Sarah leave $1 million for the benefit of their daughter, Jane. When they pass away, Jane loses all of her public benefits. The assets left to her are exposed. Her caretakers or her fam remaining family members have to go to court to deal with it. It's a massive problem. And when she passes away, all the money that was left for her benefit goes to the state of California. Flip side, Mike and Eve, same situation. They have a million dollars left for their daughter, Kate. When they pass away, Kate can still get public benefits, SSI, Medi-Cal, other very important benefits, a trusted third party's overseeing assets for her. And when Kate passes away, mm -hmm. the assets that were left for her benefit stay in the family. They go to her siblings and other family members in the nonprofits that she's worked with. So how can this be? What is the mystery? 
what they do, what did they do differently? We're going to talk about that. We will revisit the mystery. Uh, we always share this slide. Uh, it makes the point that we have dealt with now somewhere between 60 and 70 different diagnoses, underscoring what I said earlier about every, every child is unique. Every set of circumstances requires thinking that is sensitive to the circumstances of the child. So we have, I mean, look at these diagnoses, cry Duchesne syndrome, Capgras syndrome, Fragile X, Huntington's Korea, obviously autism. Everybody's different. All of these diagnoses are different and they present different special needs. And we have to craft a plan that is sensitive to these. So again, it is not the case that one size fits all, Different disabilities require different kinds of thinking. And you guys know that, you who are, who are attending this. I think everybody can relate to this. A diagnosis changes everything. You might remember that day where you got the news. So you have a child or a loved one who has an issue and an issue that's gonna, that will need support for the rest of their lives. And that's really what this is about. Uh, there, are, there is so much in the world that feels like it's out of our control. This is one area where you can take some control. And it's really a special needs trust. It is one of, if not the most important documents you will ever sign. It can provide a lifetime of protection for your child or for that member of your family with special needs. Um, and Mike, why don't you talk just a little bit about how they work? And Sure. Um, so a special needs trust can hold any amount of money any amount of money, including real property or residence, for the benefit of an individual who is disabled without disturbing eligibility for government benefits. The money in the trust doesn't count. It works in tandem and it, with and it coordinates and reinforces government benefits that may be uh, received by the individual with the disability. It's an irrevocable trust. We, Mark and I co-authored a book that is up to date, that is timely. It includes a discussion in many other programs, such as the ABLE Act, many other points that are critically important to understand. Uh, for our clients, it's available for free. We charge a very modest amount. I think it's on Amazon. I'm not even sure it's on. If it's it on is Amazon. on Amazon. It's on yes, Amazon. It is definitely on Amazon. Please and find it. It's available from, yeah. from our office as well. So, yes. um, uh, you know, we work very hard to explain things in understandable language. So if you don't have this book, you know, we do recommend it. It covers so many important points. So, so Mark, let's revisit the mystery and see what the answer is. Yes, so Tom and Sarah, remember, they left money for their daughter, Jane, and it was a mess. She lost public benefits. The family stuck in court. The money ends up going to the state of California. Why? Because they didn't have a special needs trust in place. They left money to their daughter, Jane, but they left it directly to her, or it was a special needs trust that was invalid. It wasn't done right. So her family had to go to court to fix it, to create what we call a first party special needs trust. We prefer a third party. Third, This refers to where the money came from. If it's first party, you have to go to court to set it up. That means money came to somebody not in the form of a special needs trust, and that person or their representatives have to go to court to create their own special needs trust, which costs a lot of time and money, and it's a pain. And a first party trust, if it's the beneficiary's money herself, we have to say that the state of California gets paid back for any public benefits paid out during that beneficiary's life. That's what happened here. So eventually a trust was set up for Jane, but because the parents didn't do it properly up front, the money is stuck. It has to, they have to go to court and the money ends up going to the state of California when Jane passes away. On the other hand, Mike and Eve wisely created a properly structured special needs trust ahead of time. And their estate plan said, when we pass away, we're not leaving money to Kate. We're leaving it to the special needs trust that we are creating for her. It's a third party special needs trust because it came from mom and dad. It never went to Kate. That stays in the family. The state of California can't touch it. Kate never loses eligibility for public benefits. Win-win all around. And someone that they trust is appointed ahead of time to oversee this for her benefit. So it's absolutely crucial. And you got to set this up up front. Don't wait for a crisis to do this. Don't, don't hope that things work out later. You need to set it up properly up front. And you need to make sure that it's up to date. So it's it's a lifelong financial safety net. Um, it's a way to protect your child. Um, they can retain eligibility for needs-based government benefits like SSI or Medi-Cal. Um, you can leave a house or property to the special needs trust. We'll talk a little about some tax issues. We're doing another webinar next week to really focus on property tax issues more because that's a big deal and making sure you can keep low property taxes. But you can leave a house, rental property to a special needs trust 
And you have to think about that lifelong cost of care for your child. Those, I'm sure those numbers are actually going up, but Mike's going to talk a little bit more about how you can fill that gap. Um, one thing I'll point out is sometimes people say, well, I'll just leave money to my child's sibling. Um, they can take care of their sibling. Do not do that. A special needs trust is the way to go. If it's left to a sibling, it can be exposed to creditors or lawsuits or things like that. So a special needs trust is just one part of a plan. You need to do more than just that. So let's go through the key pieces of what a properly structured special needs oriented plan is. Right. It's never just about the special needs trust. That's a component of the plan. So one of the key questions is how does the money get to the special needs trust when you pass, unless you transfer funds into it while you're living, which you can do. So typically, fundamentally, you create a living trust. Most of you know this, most of you already have a trust. It provides that upon your passing, all or a portion of the estate, depending on so many factors, assets go into the special needs trust. You need to have a durable power of attorney that is not a simple check the box form. Um, there's some activities that are simply not allowed under the super simple check the box form. Um, advanced healthcare directives. Who's gonna make healthcare decisions for you? Uh, who, wh what are the terms that you want your healthcare decision maker to respect on your behalf? Is your child, if an adult, capable of signing a power of attorney and an advanced directive as well? We work really hard to get that done. Uh, the level of capacity and understanding is the bar isn't that high, so that can that can avoid all kinds of problems. It can avoid the need to go to court to set up a conservatorship. We set up very few conservatorships. We try hard to avoid them. That may be different information than you've heard from other resources. We try to minimize, eliminate the need for conservatorships whenever possible. So again, the Living Trust directs assets into the Special Needs Trust. The Special Needs Trust is a separate freestanding entity. It is an embedded in the revocable living trust. There's a list of reasons why that is done. Uh, if you have kids who are not disabled, the Family Protection or Dynasty Trust, trust which, which uh, Mark will discuss a little bit later, that's the protective approach to make sure that that money remains in the family, that it's there for the grandkids. It's all integrated along with so many tax issues that have to be considered. Right. Just, and just along those lines, uh, we, I don't want to spend too little. We have plenty of talks on our Gilfix Law YouTube channel where we talk about other planning tools when you have a child who doesn't have special needs. But the point here is a special needs trust is critical for your child on the autism spectrum. You might have other kids. And there are a lot of ways we can protect assets for them as mm -hmm. well, meeting different goals. So there are a lot of tools out there. That's not the focus of tonight. But why don't we just kind of give a, a visual illustration of that? Um and Mike, do you want to go? Through yeah, sure. This? Um, and, and by the way, if you have questions or if you'd like to leave any contact information for us to follow up with you, use the Q&A function, which is available with a click. So be sure to do that. We'll try to leave some time to answer some questions at the end. OK, so go for it if you have any questions. OK, so here we are. Visually, you set up a living trust. Your assets, other than retirement accounts, all of your assets, real property, investment accounts, <clears throat> they're all titled in the name of the trust. Upon your passing, assets are distributed to the trust that you set up for your kids. So if you have two kids, one is on the spectrum, one is not, one is doing really well. Let's say it's 50-50. Half of the estate is directed to the special needs trust for the son in this illustration. The other half of the estate is directed to the family protection, a dynasty trust for the benefit of your other child. Um, visually, you know, it's simple. Obviously, there's some complications here. We just want to make sure that regardless of the approach that's taken, we're protecting inherited assets for the benefit of your kids and ultimately for the benefit of the grandkids. Yeah, and, and you don't need to do the family protection trust, by the way. That's just an example of one of the tools you can use. A lot of parents will just leave money to the special needs trust for the, the beneficiary on the autism spectrum and just leave money directly to other kids. And it's not always 50-50, of course. You got to make sure there's enough there. To support your child, which is a whole nother issue that we're going to talk about mm -hmm. in a moment. Beneficiaries, your child, we say beneficiaries, your child is complicated, right? Your loved one is complicated. We all are. Everybody's unique. So you have to think about their specific needs. Do they have communication problems? Will they be able to even tell people what they need after you're gone? Um, so a trustee's job is often to say no, frankly, because they your child might be asking them for money or asking them to buy things that they might not need, or there might be bad influences in their life. The trustee's job is to be 
very smart about managing assets. They have a fiduciary duty, a duty to be conservative, to make the funds last for your child's life, and to make sure those basic needs are always met. Um, and a special needs trust is critical and necessary. But as we just talked about, it's not enough on its own. You have to have your own plan in place. You have to make sure your financial plan is, is structured, that you've thought that through. Um, and you need to address other issues. So the special needs trust is critical, but it's not enough on its own. Um, that's kind of the key point here. And I, I, you don't have this in the slide here, but one question we get is, well, my, my son is, he's doing well. I'm worried he might not be able to work. He might need government benefits, but he might be able to work. You know, some of the best programmers in Silicon Valley are, are almost certainly on the spectrum. Many are openly on the spectrum. Elon Musk on Saturday Night Live talked about how he's on the spectrum. What if your child becomes Elon Musk? Not the end of the ah! world. He created a special needs trust. <laughs> well, hey, there's some people. He's, he's very successful. Whatever you think of him. Um, so, a special needs trust. If if your child is working and thriving financially, hey, no big deal. The trust is still there to support them, and a third party's in charge of it and can just make sure that money's well guarded for them. But if they don't, if if they don't need government benefits, no big deal. But if they do need government benefits, absolutely critical to have that special needs trust in place. Um, and, and what can you do to make sure? that your child's needs are are met. And, and this is a big source of stress for people. I say, you know, I know my my son or my daughter, but how is someone 20, 30 years from now going to have any idea what they like and what they don't like? Well, that's where a letter of guidance can come in. So we strongly recommend, it's in our book, uh, Social Needs, Cre Special Needs Trust Creation and Management Guide. But when we're talking to clients and we're working with families, we'll often talk about, hey, Create a guidebook for your child. You know, what would you want a third party to know about your son if, if they never met him before and have to take over management of all of his finances? You know, does he like video games? If so, make it okay for them to use trust funds to buy video games. Um, does he like skateboarding? Does he like movies? Does he like Disneyland? Um, what types of therapists are really important to have? You can create this letter of guidance. It doesn't need to be part of the trust. It's something that you write to provide people with guidance after you're gone. And you really want to build a team. You know, after you want to have a legal team and we love being part of that. So a team of advisors can work with you on the legal side over the long term. You want to have a financial advisory team and a care team. You know, you want everybody to be working together. You want to keep track of who these people are so they can all talk to each other. So if something happens to you, you have that team in place. Pacific Autism Center for Education, it can be part of that team. Um, by the way, we didn't talk about this much, but when a lot of families will name nonprofits as beneficiaries of the trust when their child passes away. They might leave a bunch to other family members. But if you get a lot of help from this care team, let's say a nonprofit like, like PACE is part of that care team. Hey, leave a portion of the trust to PACE when your child passes away to, as sort of a thank you and a way to, to pay it forward from other families. So building that team and also recognizing that team in the future is so is so crucial. Um, so you want to talk about just some of that. We're not spending much time on public benefits, um, the specific programs, but SSI. Sure. And, um, you know, I, I just want to say um, I've read so many letters of guidance that our clients have prepared for their kids. One of the most striking dealt with uh, a particular deli where the trustee was to make sure that they bought a sandwich for their daughter, the detail about the sandwich, what's on it, when to get it, how hot it has, you, you, five paragraphs about the luncheon meat that was supposed to be purchased every day for their daughter. Um, it, were, it, it was funny. I mean, everybody laughed, but it was critically important. And it just, it just made the point that was quality of life to that young woman. And, you know, we took it very seriously, even though it was funny. Okay. Um, so, th so the point of this slide is to uh, emphasize that if an individual is disabled, and in this context, it has to do with the ability to get a job and make a living. It isn't that a diagnosis of being like on the spectrum means that you qualify for government benefits. It's a matter of establishing that you're not able to make a living. And if that's the case, there's a program, SSI, Supplemental Security Income. It guarantees a minimum monthly income in California of about $1,040 a month. Not a fortune, but it beats the heck out of nothing. Uh, there are a lot of rules that have to be honored. The money can be used for certain functions, but not others. If you give money to your child or pay for certain things for your child, or if the trustee does, it can result in the, in the, in the reduction in the amount of the SSI check. So just to say, you, if you're helping your child, the trustee of the trust has to understand these rules. 
has to have discipline, know what to do, know what not to do, and just make sure that everything is handled properly. Uh, the next topic, this is one of the most important topics we could ever touch upon, choice of the trustee. It's not uncommon to talk about a trust. Everybody gets that. When it comes to the choice of the trustee, who's going to take care of your child after you're gone? That can be a 45-minute, one-hour discussion to go through the options. We understand how important it is. No decision is more important. So where do you go? How do you go through the process of identifying the appropriate trustee, noting that the key criterion is finding a responsible person? So first, of course, you look to family members. We're careful about naming a sibling of the child, but that can work. Other family members. Then if you don't find somebody there, is there a long-term trusted close friend? Not somebody you met at church last week and boy, do you ever like them. You know, it's gotta be somebody tried and true. So we're looking at individuals, very personal relationships there. If you don't find somebody there and you like the idea of an individual having a responsibility, there are professionals who accept this responsibility. There are individu uh, individuals who are professional fiduciaries, and they accept the role of being a trustee. Many attorneys accept this role in special cases. If you don't find somebody there, you're probably looking at a financial entity, a bank, a trust company. Um, there are some that are good at it. There are some that will accept it, but really don't train their staff to understand what special needs is. We have a pretty good sense of which banks take this more seriously and which may be more appropriate than others. So again, that's a talking point. Be very careful about that decision. Can you have co-trustees? Many people like that. You know, I don't like the idea of my daughter managing all the money for her brother. I don't want her to have to say no, but I want her involved. So she could be a co-trustee with a professional, for example. The professional producer is the one who says no. The daughter is the one who says yes. You know, you, you manage these things to, to keep it mellow, to make it work well. Uh, there is another resource. There's something called a pooled trust. Many of them exist in California. These are nonprofit organizations. The idea is usually with smaller estates where many professional fiduciaries and banks won't accept a trust unless it has like at least a million dollars, some minimums. So the pool trust where many, many people pool their money, a list of beneficiaries, enough money is generated, we hope, uh, to generate enough fees to pay the staff members who take care of it. So the point here is that we know how difficult this decision is. We can yeah. advise about it. We always come up with solutions. Um, there's always somebody who is right for you. Um, you know, Mark, you um, have a lot of direct experience dealing with yeah. challenges here. Um, maybe well, so, yeah, talk we, about we this. Work, yeah, we work with a lot of fiduciaries and, and family members who are serving as trustees. We advise a lot of trustees. We've served as trustee before. So trustees have to be kind of tough at times. You know, what if there is a demanding beneficiary, especially with mental health issues? Um, we have, we know some fiduciaries who specialize in dealing with people who can be very challenging at times. Um, and a trustee really has to be aware of other resources as well. They have to manage the money properly, but they also have to be aware of, hey, if, if this person is eligible for SSI or Medi-Cal or other programs, and they make sure that they don't interfere with that eligibility, or does it make sense for them to maintain eligibility? Is there enough in the trust? So maybe those, those benefits aren't worth the hassle. Um, that would have to be a, obviously a larger trust in that case, but trustees also have to work really hard to try to find quality caregivers. Um, they have to be that quarterback in some ways to build the care team. The trustee's job is not to take care of all the day-to-day -day steps. Their job is to help make sure the assets in the trust are properly deployed to build that proper team. Um, they have to find quality caregivers, and that's getting harder and harder. Although perhaps with the economic downturn, there'll be more people available for caregiving. But certainly in the last few years, it has been really hard for people to find good caregivers. You have to make sure they're properly um, paid. You know, don't pay them out of pocket under the table. There are all sorts of risks there. So you find the right agency or the right people to work with. And how do you coordinate with other family members? I can get input from other family members without interfering with uh, your role as trustee, taking input but still the trustee has to make the final decision. So it's it's a, a very challenging role. And so when you're choosing trustees, and again, as Mike said, this is often one of the most important parts of our meetings with families with which we work. You've got to ask questions, especially if it's not someone in your immediate family. Often uh, parents will name the, the child's sibling as trustee if they're responsible and have a good relationship. But if you don't have a clear choice within your family, 
Or even if you do, you got to talk to them and you have to ask some good questions. You have to make sure they're willing to serve. Trustees are entitled to reasonable compensation. They can pay themselves a reasonable hourly rate, which is professionals have their own fee schedules. A non-professional can charge up to what a professional would charge. Many banks, many fiduciaries will charge an annual flat fee, you know, 1% of what the trust is holding when they're managing it. So you have to make sure you understand how they're going to charge. Are they willing to do it? Do they have the capacity? Are they young enough to serve? And if not, if, if they're not going to be able to serve for your child's life, what's their plan for succession? Um, do they have an idea of what they're going to do when they retire, when they can no longer serve? Do they have experience managing money or working with financial advisors? That goes back to having that integrated team. How do they approach financial issues in management? And if they're a professional or a family member or a bank, do they have experience with special needs trusts? And it's okay if they don't, especially if it's a family member or a good friend, but do they know how to get that help? Do they know where to go? You may want to help them with this if, if they're willing to serve. So you want to talk to people and you can change your trustee choices over time. Special needs trusts are technically irrevocable. But that's really only after you're gone. Um, there are many ways to change the trust while you're still living. You, and many people will set up a special needs trust. Five years later, the trustees they named are no longer the right choices. So they'll revisit it. They'll make updates. They'll make changes. And we'll create special needs trust two, uh, a new version of it. So there are a lot of ways we can change that. But it's really important to understand that over time. Um, now, we want to talk about a really important subject. We're going to give a whole talk next week about this. We have other webinars on our Gilfix Law YouTube channel about this. But that's a version of a new death tax in California. Um, I always think this is funny because it's the Grim Reaper getting a tax bill. Um, be great if the Grim Reaper would pay my taxes. Um, but in, in this case, very it's not the case. Your family would get this tax bill. And what are we talking about? We're talking about property taxes. Uh, again, not the subject of today's talk. We're going to spend more time on this um, next week and in other talks. But the key here is if you want to leave your house for your child to live in or a rental property that you have that you want that your child is comfortable and you want to leave for them, you need to be aware of Prop 19. Prop 19 eviscerated, got rid of Prop 58. Now, what is that? Up until February 15th, 2021, when Prop 19 became law, parents could pass their primary residence to their kids, didn't matter if the kids kept it as a rental or lived in it, and there was no change in property taxes. Didn't matter if it was a $10 million house or with a $100,000 assessed value. And by the way, the assessed value is what property taxes are based on. Prop 13 keeps assessed values very low, even if the, the value of the house goes up a lot. So it, it didn't matter what the value of the house was. It didn't matter what the assessed value was. Whatever mom and dad were paying, the kids could pay that, whether they had special needs or not. Rental properties were largely protected as well. You could pass up to $1 million in assessed value properties to your kids with no change in property taxes. That's assessed value, not fair market value. So largely speaking, you could pass a lot of property for the benefit of your kids if you're lucky enough to have that with no change in property taxes. That is gone. Um, Prop 19 gutted that. There are still some protections for the primary residents. There are no protections for the rental properties. We have many clients who have condo or, or some other investment property that they hope to leave for their child um, with autism. And all of a sudden now you have to think about the fact that property taxes can go up 5x, 10x. It can be hundreds of thousands of dollars over time and increase property taxes unless you plan ahead. And again, I'm not going to go into the specifics of this problem or even of, of the solution, but we do have solutions. We've helped hundreds of families with this to lock in low property taxes over the long term. It's a very complex <laughs> subject. We're going to spend some time on that next week. We have other talks on our Gilfix Law YouTube channel about this. But if you have a home that you've owned for a long time, and if you have rental properties you want to keep to support your child, down the road after you're gone, you need to talk to us about this. We can go through the issue, how it will affect you, and what solutions we can deploy to keep low property taxes in place for the duration. Save, And we've run some numbers. It can be up to literally hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars over your child's lifetime if we can lock in low property taxes. So talk to us if you have those issues. Mm -hmm. Along those lines. Yeah. Th that, enough? that point goes, goes directly to the cost of living for a child with a disability, maybe for anybody, but obviously disability is our focus here. So is there gonna be enough money? Are there gonna be enough resources to take care of your child? We have some data here that um, is pretty well known that lifetime support for a person on the spectrum between 1.4 and 2.4 million. I'll tell you, this is dated. 
Uh, we got these figures about a year ago. We have Prop 19, which dramatically increases the cost of property taxes. We have inflation that has shocked us all. So these numbers are, are conservative. Uh, if anything, it's higher, it's certainly not lower. So how much money do you leave in a special needs trust, assuming you have enough? Um, if you're blessed with having enough money, you do think hard about this. Should I leave all the money for my kids? Should it be a quarter? Should it be a half? And what do I do? So one of the approaches that we take to being sure that there's a safety net, that there's at least some minimum number of dollars, at least a quarter of a million or a half a million, if at all possible, is life insurance. Um, it makes sense. You may have a modest estate, but your life insurable. Uh, that is a way of being sure that upon your passing, some amount of money is going to go into the special needs trust. The, the life insurance policy often is what's called the second to die. So the insurance company is betting on two lives. So it costs a little bit less to obtain a policy for maybe $500,000 or a million dollars. It can be affordable. And it can give a great deal of peace of mind. So let's look at a real life example. This is a matter uh, with which uh, that I still think about all the time because it was just incredibly rewarding because of how this worked out. This was a situation where a couple came to see us, see me. Uh, you can see the ages. They were 48 and 45 in good health. Very importantly, they're in good health. They had two kids. One was healthy, uh, running around the room during the meeting that we had. And the other was severely, severely disabled, not autism, uh, physiological problems uh, where they said it took almost three hours using a dropper to feed a child, a, to feed the child a meal, to get enough nutrition into that child. You can just imagine how exhausting that would be. It would just consume your life. They believed they needed to leave everything they had in their estate to the special needs trust for their child, leaving nothing for their other kid. And when the when the husband said that, I, I, if you can just imagine this, the wife starts crying. She looks at her other son who's running around the room. You know, it was horrible. It was very, very challenging. Fortunately, they brought the wife's parents along uh, just for support. They weren't planning on getting involved. They just wanted to hear what this trust means. What does it mean to see a lawyer and all of that? So the parents of the wife decided to help out. We involved the insurance professional with whom we worked. The question is, What's it going to cost to get a $1 million life insurance policy to be sure, to be sure that there's going to be at least a million dollars going into the special needs trust when mom and dad are gone. And you can see the two options that they came up with at that point in time. There could be an annual premium of about $4,300. That would go on forever. That would be a lot of money. The alternative that I felt was more attractive was one premium payment only, about $60,000 and they're done. The policy is locked in, it's paid up. Again, enter the grandparents. They agreed to put up a portion of the money so that this couple could buy the second to die life insurance policy. They did. The relief was incredible. So after this work, after we worked this through and the policy was locked in, I got a phone call from that wife that I will never, ever, ever forget. She said, that because of this level of assurance that there's gonna be this reasonable amount of money going into the trust, for the first time they felt that they could leave a portion of their estate to their other kid. And let me tell you, she was just sobbing and it, it got me pretty good too. I'll tell you, it gets me right now. Um, and she also said that this gave them such a feeling of relief that for the first time, that their child was three years old, for the first time they felt sort of liberated the first time they went down to Carmel for an overnight while the grandparents babysat, which was a heck of a challenge, but it was life changing for them. It isn't always that dramatic, but it just makes the point that life insurance is one of the tools that we look at because you got to be sure there's going to be enough money there if it is at all possible to take care of your child, to pay for things that the government benefit programs will not cover because surprise of surprise, the government programs are not perfect. They don't cover everything. So Yeah, and this is, of course... Key. Yeah, this is just illustrative, but there's a lot of factors that go into that. Um, and also, I'll just say, if you have an older life insurance policy, let us know. We can connect you with experts who can look at those. Often older policies, you can trade them in for much better ones. Uh, it gets into the pricing of life insurance over time. So let us know if you have questions about that. We can connect you with the right people. It can really help. Um, and, and this just goes to the importance of coordinated financial planning. 
Uh, do you have an integrated legal and financial team? Are your assets, your assets properly titled in your living trust? Life insurance policies, 401k policies, IRAs, you have to make sure they're all coordinated properly and that, that they go to the special needs trust for your child, that the beneficiary designations for those policies, because life insurance, retirement accounts are not in your living trust. Your, your core estate plan doesn't direct those. So you have to make sure everything is titled right, that beneficiary designations are right, that your trust is coordinated. And does your financial plan truly reflect the long-term needs of your child while taking into to account your long-term care needs and your expenses. So there's a lot of layers to this, and we are big believers that it is wonderful to coordinate these things. If you manage your own investments, hey, you need to make sure that you're talking to your lawyer regularly. If you have an advisor, we always recommend an advisor who really understands special needs issues and that one hand is talking to the other, that it's not, you don't have silos, that your financial advisors checking in with your attorneys, your attorneys are checking in with your financial advisors. Again, that assets are properly titled, that you're thinking about the numbers, right? If you're looking at gaps, how can you close those gaps? What do you need to do to make sure there's enough there for you? And of course, for your child with special needs. Um, do other family members know about the special needs trust? We talk about the curse of the small inheritance. What if grandma and grandpa want to leave some money to help out your child because they want to do good and they don't know about the special needs trust or they don't update their plan? Remember those examples earlier of the family that failed to create a special needs trust? Well, if grandma and grandpa want to leave a little bit of money, and I use that relative, it's a relative term, uh, but let's say they want to leave $50,000 for the benefit of your child. If you have a special needs trust, they need to leave it to the trust. If they don't, we face all those issues we talked about, having to go to court, having to create a different type of trust, having to deal with a bunch of messes, interfering with public benefits. So it's really important that everybody's planning is coordinated. And we'll often work with multiple family members to make sure grandma and grandpa, aunt and uncle, mom and dad, all are directing assets to the right place for that child who will need it. Um, and do you have a plan that will help to pay for your own long-term care? We talked about that a little bit, but there are a lot of pieces here. So you want to be sure that your financial advisor is communicating with your estate planning attorney. We're working on some partnerships with um, some financial advisors we've worked with for a while. Talk to us if you're interested in that. If you don't have an advisor, you need one, let us know. We can make some introductions to some wonderful advisors we've known. Um, but we really believe in integrated legal and financial planning. So when you work with us, we can offer ideas, approaches for that. If you don't have an advisor, you're happy with one. We can help connect you with different people. But it, it, the big picture is one hand should be talking to the other. One missing piece can cause all sorts of issues. So, uh, and, and as you look at your own plan, I think it's, re it's really important that you revisit your estate plan regularly. Uh, and Mike, do you want to talk just about the importance of reviewing an existing plan, even if you have one already in place. Sure. And I think this is really important because in our relatively sophisticated community here, most people understand the need for a trust and you probably set it up already. Fine. Um, but, you know, life moves on. Legal issues arise. There's changes in the law. Uh, there's issues and opportunities of which you may not be aware. So, yeah, you need to review your estate plan. We all do every couple of years. Is the structure of your trust right? If you're a couple, there's the ABC trust, there's the AB trust, there's other, there's like three or four different uh, approaches that can be taken in, in your living trust. <clears throat> Did you know about dynasty trust, for example? Are you aware of all the tax issues? And that's been changing dramatically. The estate tax rules are changing. The property tax rules change dramatically. Mark talked about that. We have to be aware of capital gains tax, gift tax. So there's many tax issues and they do change and they do evolve, you may not have taken that into account sufficiently when you did your plan. And again, we, we change. You, your, your estate may have grown. It may have changed the nature of your assets. So you want to be careful. Uh, don't just do a check the box form. This is this is your life. This is your family. You, you kind of know this. Um, you know that you need to pay attention to it. So let's do that. You know, Let's make sure that everything is up to date. It doesn't take that much time to look at what a plan says. And you know, if we did your plan five or 10 years ago, it's time to come in. Uh, last week, I met with somebody and what, what, what I said when they, sat down, when they sat down, I said, yeah, you know, we should review your plan like you're doing right now every 22 years. Okay. Right, let, let's calendar 22 years down the road for the next review because that's how much yeah. time they waited. And wow, did they have changes. So, so be, be on top of it. We're available to work with you on all these things. Yeah, so let's look forward. You know, what what do you need to do? Well, you need to, if you have a plan, 
we can help you review it. You need to take a fresh look every few years. Your situation changes. And the key thing here is if you don't have a plan in place, there is no safety net for your child until your full plan is in place. Your updated living trust, your beneficiary designations, life insurance policy, obviously the special needs trust, everything has to fit together. So don't lose this opportunity while this is all top of mind. We'd love to get the chance to meet with you, especially members of the, the Pacific Autism Center for Education community. Um, I, I love the families I've worked with from that community. We can review your existing plan. Even if you have a special needs plan, let's take a fresh look and make sure it's up to date. And if you don't have that, we have to put one into place and we can certainly help. And especially for the PACE community, uh, and, and we'll talk about Prop 19 next week. So spread the word. We'll talk about how that affects spe families with special needs issues in particular. They are hurt, we believe, more than any other uh, group of families. And there's no carve out in this law if you have a child with, with a disability. Uh, but if you're not sure, if you'd like to just get the chance, we would love to chat with you for a few minutes. If you'd like to just get to know Mike or I a little bit, we're happy to set an initial 20-minute call for people who are members of the PACE community, where a Zoom meeting is even better, or even in person in our office in Palo Alto. We'd love to get to know you. When we work with families, There's a we bill hourly when we're actually sitting down and structuring your plan. We have flat fees for documents. But if you just want to ask us some simple questions, again, for members of the PACE community, we are happy to sit down with you for 20 minutes, no charge, or a Zoom meeting, or even a phone call. Let us know. You can reach us pretty easily. Um, you can give us your information in the Q&A function. We'll get to a couple questions in a moment. Um, but you can leave your inf information in the Q&A function if you're watching this live. Um, if you're watching this as a recording, you can meet us at, you can call us, 650-493-8070. You can go to our website, guildfix.com. Guildfix.com backslash my needs has a checklist you can fill out, or you can just go to the contact us form. But don't delay. You know, this is top of mind. Spread the word. We know there are so families with so many families with these issues who don't take action and they are left with messes down the road. And we're involved often in cleaning up those messes. And it's a lot more expensive than just solving these issues up front. While this is top of mind, take action. Stakes couldn't be higher. We'd love to get the chance to meet with you. Maybe it's just, I had a meeting with someone last week and it was just to review the fact that her plan looked actually pretty good. We just had the meeting, we went over it and there were really no major changes or recommendations. And she just had peace of mind from that. But most of the time there's some issues and it's been a while since you looked at things. And again, we'd love to get the chance to help you and your family, especially members of the PACE community. So uh, on that note, again, easy to contact us. You can find us online, gilfix.com. We're not hard to reach, um, but reach out if you'd like us to, to meet or if you'd like to chat about these things. And now let's get to just uh, a couple questions. Yeah. Like I know uh, yeah. you want to get to one in particular. So which one would well, you well, like to a couple. Take? So one, one really good question. Uh, are special needs trusts only for your kids? Can they be for anybody else? Uh, they can be for anybody. Uh, it could be, you could set it up for a niece, for a nephew, for a sibling. We have had folks set up special needs trusts for friends. What is really interesting is when kids, maybe 40, 50, 60, 70 years old, actually set up a special needs trust for their parents. They may be looking at long-term care and the cost and qualifying for Medi-Cal, and the kids want to make sure there's a safety net for their parents. So, so uh, really, anybody can be a beneficiary of a special needs trust. Yeah, and that, that actually gets a whole other side of this. And, and part of that is protecting your assets for you if you need long-term care and making sure your estate plan is properly set up there. Mm, really? We have another webinar on the astounding power of multi-generational planning on our Gilfix Law YouTube channel. If you're watching this there, like, subscribe, follow us, or even if you're watching this live, check out our channel. We have lots of free webinars posted there, lots of free educational content. Um, but special needs trust can be, yeah, absolutely does not have to just be parents for child. Um, we, we kind of addressed this before. We had a question, can you leave a house or a rental property to a special needs trust? Absolutely. And if you're leaving a house to a special needs trust, you have to keep in mind, how are you going to pay? How is the trust going to pay expenses? Are they going to pay utilities, property taxes? So if your child is going to live in the house, and I have many clients who say, hey, I want to leave my house to my child. My house is my biggest asset. I don't have much outside of it. Well, that's a problem. Uh, because again, what if the roof needs to be repaired? You know, what about replacing um, the water heater? You and what if to make sure? And what if, and what if property taxes go up thirty thousand yep. dollars a year? Yep, exactly. And and so all of this has to be taken into account, which is why it's so powerful to have that integrated team um, to think this all through. And we can think this all through. We work with so many families in so many situations. We can flag the issues that you need to be aware of. 
Um, but one of the big ones, if yeah, if you want to leave property to your child or a rental property to the trust can be rented out. That rental income can support your child. Again, you got to deal with this Prop 19 issue. Um, a rental property might be profitable now, but if property taxes go up 10, 20, 30, $40,000 a year, maybe it no longer makes any money. It's going to have to be sold and, and reinvested. So um, a lot of different issues we have to think about, but at the core, you need to make sure that your own estate plan is in place, your living trust, your power of attorney, your advanced directive, all needs to be coordinated to direct money and assets to that separate special needs trust for your child. Uh, and again, for the PACE community, we'd love to get the chance to chat with you. So like, reach out to our office to say, hey, I'm a part of the PACE community, and we are happy to, to chat with you for 20 minutes, no, no charges to get to know you, make sure that we're a fit for you, or we can at least flag the issues you should be aware of. And if you want to move forward with an official planning meeting, of course, that's that's great. We'd invite you to join our client community. If you are already a client, reach out to us. Maybe it's time for that refresher. Um, but I think we'll take one more question. Anything else you want to take, Mike? Any specific question? Uh, no, there's one we really... Go ahead if you, if you have more. I, I, I'm fine here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And some of the questions, we got a couple of questions that were very specific to specific yeah. situations. Yeah. Um, and, and I had one other question too of the issue of leaving at this. I think it was before we got to this of leaving assets to the sibling and they can just take care of your child. Why not that? Don't leave money to a sibling for that sibling to use the money to take care of their child, of their sibling with special needs. What if they get sued? What if they have financial issues? What if they pass away? What happens then? That's why it's so crucial to have that special needs trust. So Use this information while it's top of mind, while you're energized, whether you're watching this live or as a recording, take action. We would love to get the chance to help you. The book is available on Amazon, uh, Special Needs Trust Creation Management Guide, or, or look up Special Needs Trust Gilfix, our, our YouTube channel. But most importantly, meet with us directly. We work with families anywhere in California. We can work via Zoom or in person in, in Palo Alto. But regardless, we hope you got a lot out of this. We thank the PACE community in particular. You can leave assets to PACE from your special needs trust. <laughs> Talk to us about that. There's ways you can support PACE and other wonderful organizations. So on that note, we're going to call it uh, an evening. We hope everybody's staying safe, sane, and healthy. And we'll talk to you soon. Good night, all. <laughs>